Continuing with <coughs> the weathering, let's look at a little bit more detail about the terrestrial weathering processes. Uh, when we do carbon cycle and mass budget, uh, especially over longer time scales, geological, biological, chemical and uh, climate processes get involved in uh, the weathering rates and uh, we already looked a little bit uh, at that and uh, estimates of modern fluxes of uh, various geologic processes uh, in terms of their uh, regulation of CO2. Uh, here we are looking at a nice schematic that shows the main processes. Uh, these are called reactive transport models which quantitatively evaluate the coupling of physical, chemical and biological processes that determine the formation, operation and evolution of Earth's surface system. So when you go around and look at the Earth's surface, you see vegetation, rocks, soil, deserts and so on. But over time, all these physical, chemical and biological processes have been involved in uh, the uh, evolution of those surfaces and of course they keep changing as well as climate changes. Um, so here we are looking at the scales going uh, in time scale from uh, 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the 6 in years and spatial scales are also going from uh, 10 to the minus 6 which is at the DNA RNA scale to 10 to the 6 uh, <coughs> planetary scales. <coughs> So the outer envelope here is the landscape evolution. Within that we have uh, biogeochemistry where biology and chemistry are interacting uh, together with geology and there is a lot of isotope chemistry involved there. Uh, hydrogeology uh, which is uh, how the water processes are interacting with geological processes and evolution. Microbiology, for example, in the soils and in sediments uh, or in the ocean, how they are involved in uh, altering the chemistry which we already looked at a little bit in terms of methanogenesis and their seepage into the uh, uh, pores uh, producing CO2 eventually and so on. Uh, chemical weathering of course is a broad term where uh, even the uh, roots for example can begin to uh, uh, produce carbonic acid uh, on the surface of the rocks and slowly degrade it and make it more vulnerable to weathering or increase weatherability of rocks. Rhizosphere dynamics we'll see in a minute is where the roots are uh, releasing various chemicals into the soil <coughs> that's altering the soil chemistry and so on. Watershed hydrogeochemistry obviously and geomorphology we already looked at uh, um, tectonic um, processes, um, uplifts and so on. And climate change and biogeochemical cycling which is where we are headed in terms of the broad theme where we want to understand the weathering processes and carbon cycle evolution and climate regulation to see how we are altering this uh, and how uh, we can uh, navigate the future of climate change and biogeochemical cycling, right? <coughs> so quickly, uh, here we are looking at uh, potentially vapor transpiration divided by precipitation. Uh, whether it's less than one or greater than one depends on what climate you have. So in a humid climate, uh, water is not a limitation, so water is abundant and gases actually control the weathering. And when you have dry arid climate, then uh, actually pot uh, potentially transpiration tends to be higher than the meager precipita precipitation that falls. And in, oops, in this case, uh, water is scarce and it tends to limit um, the weathering. Of course, there are details in terms of the soil processes, rhizosphere processes and uh, so on. But in general, the carbon that's in the soil begins to alter the structure of the uh, soil itself, its water holding capacity, its nutrient cycling and so on. This is one of the reasons why uh, people try to enhance soil organic carbon and now uh, part of the carbon capture in the end may uh, uh, involve creating biochar out of biogenic material and spreading it on the soil so that you put 
carbon into the soil which uh, makes the soil very healthy and increases crop yields and so on. So when you have low moisture soils and occluded carbon you can see here that uh, minerals and organic matters are arranged in a certain way. When you have high moisture soils the sorbed carbon as opposed to occluded carbon you can see that uh, here is carbon uh, organic matter uh, hanging around whereas here it is sorbed onto the uh, soils. Uh, so the primary mechanism for carbon stabilization likely differs in high and low moisture soils. In low moisture soils physical separation dominates uh, because the lack of water may separate microbial enzymes from readily degradable uh, carbon in particles or microclusters. In high moisture soils carbon stabilization may be dominated by organic carbon sorption into uh, onto wetted mineral surfaces. High moisture soils also can facilitate microbial degradation because uh, micro microbial enzymes will more likely be in contact with uh, the carbon. So obviously that would uh, change the CO2 uh, and uh, carbon cycle and generally biogeochemical cycle. Um, in the rhizosphere, obviously, uh, over time, uh, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, we talked about before, the uh, photosynthesizers going from the ocean onto land and then trying to stand up straight on land, building hard structures. As they got taller, they changed their surface roughness, boundary layer length, and then they had to compete for light and also grow uh, tall enough to spread their pollen into the free uh, atmosphere above the uh, the surface friction layer and so on and so forth. So that process also is complicated as you can see here primary mineral dissolution, <coughs> rhizosphere exudates, uh, organo uh, metal complexes and uh, secondary mineral uh, precipitation. So rhizosphere processes influence the development of biogeochemical gradients at a range of spatial scales including soil profile scale, pore scale and mineral surface scale. Representation of these processes in reactive transport models requires consideration of how rhizosphere processes vary over spatial and temporal scales of interest. So uh, we are obviously talking about multiple scales here. The other process that's of importance is uh, for uh, carbon cycling and weathering rates and weatherability and production of uh, weatherability or chemical weathering by chewing into rocks and soils uh, are so-called hyporheic processes where there is interactions between surface water and groundwater. So these are also happening at different interfaces at different scales. Uh, scale. So here you, you have a meander-driven exchange with the groundwater, you have bar-driven exchange, you have bedform-driven exchange, so there you see the groundwaters and the various uh, interactions. Very schematic, but you get the sense that uh, evolution of geological features uh, and uh, hyperaic processes and uh, biogeochemistry uh, and carbon cycle all go hand in hand. Without going into too much detail, obviously uh, we also need to worry about biogeochemical processes in marine sediments. We already talked about worms that are going around producing me methane in anaerobic conditions and that methane seeping into holes and uh, doing uh, the reaction of uh, releasing CO2 and so on. And here are the ways in which isotopes are used to identify key processes of interest. So this is a reaction network and fractionation. I hope you know what fractionation is. Generally biology uh, tends to fractionate uh, and there are other uh, isotopic fractionation processes as well. Uh, biology, for example, prefers to take up C12 when it wants to uh, photosynthesize, so C12O2 gets taken up more than C13O2, but if 
CO2 is limited then obviously more C13O2 would be taken up and so on. So we'll come back to uh, this a little bit later on but I wanted to uh, put it here as a placeholder and when we look at long time scales here we'll, uh, we are looking at temperature anomalies with respect to the 1961 to 1990 uh, base period uh, estimated from various paleo proxies going back to the uh, time of the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 uh, 70 million years ago and you can see there have been ups and downs and you can see temperatures in the past and the CO2 in the atmosphere were much much higher than where we were of course there were no human beings then so it's not a question of in the future whether planet will survive and biology will survive the question is really what will happen to human beings but coming back to weather, uh, weathering and carbon cycle uh, many times people have to go back and uh, uh, understand the uh, ups and downs in temperature better in terms of the controlling processes whether it's weathering rates or whether the uh, it is uh, atmospheric processes like temperature uh, change rainfall change and carbon dioxide change and so on and so forth and of course tectonics and weathering may be very critically involved here as well uh, start uh, with in the cooling that started about 50 million years ago and then got uh, changed by uh, human activities in the uh, Holocene especially since the end of the last ice age uh, because uh, Indian subcontinent crashed into Asian landmass uh, built up the Himalayas and exposed a lot of weatherable materials monsoon got set up so weathering rates went up tremendously because of new material and a lot of water uh, and that's considered one of the reasons to explain the drop in temperature and the drop in CO2 that goes with it. Of course in this course we are worried about where we are headed into the future in terms of carbon and the impacts on global warming. So carbon capture, utilization and sequestration is obviously going to worry about the navigation of these future trajectories of greenhouse gases and uh, global warming. So. We are building the history of carbon cycle evolution, climate regulation uh, to understand uh, uh, where we are headed uh, as far as the future is concerned and what processes we are looking at here may be um, helpful in designing geoengineering ex uh, experiments in terms of uh, accelerated weathering or enhanced alkalinity and so on to draw down uh, carbon dioxide as part of carbon capture and utilization. Okay, So we will come back to more detailed processes of terrestrial uh, weathering and carbon sinks uh, in the next uh, podcast.